Bertrand Russell's theory of descriptions had an absolutely enormous impact on philosophy. Uh, in fact, his article on denoting, in which he famously defends this theory, is generally seen as being one of the defining paradigmatic pieces of analytic philosophy. Um, but it, it can be quite technical. Uh, and unless you have a formal education in philosophy, there's a good chance you won't have explored this side of the subject. So in this series, I uh, want to give a hopefully accessible exposition of Russell's theory, um, and some of its criticisms and, and so on. Uh, well, we need to begin with some background. When we think about expressions that refer to things in the world, we can generally class them into two types general terms and singular terms. General terms are terms that refer to many things. So the noun car, for example, it doesn't name a particular car, but it, it seems to apply to all the things that are cars. Similarly, blue applies to all blue things, and so on. And, and here are some other examples. Computer, that doesn't name a particular computer, it refers to all computers. A man, that doesn't pick out a particular man, and so on. Singular terms are terms that refer to an individual thing, and these include uh, proper names, such as Frank Zappa, Red Dwarf, the name of the wonderful TV show, Malcolm Tucker, that's a fictional character, and, and so on, London as a city. Um, definite descriptions. Definite descriptions are, are phrases of the form the such and such, so the composer of Joe's Garage, the capital city of England, the first man killed in a car accident, etc. Uh, and demonstratives, you, him, her, he, and so on. The point is, singular terms pick out an individual thing. Um, so with Frank Zappa, well, there's only one Frank Zappa. Uh, obviously there might be other people with the same name, but under normal circumstances, when we use the name Frank Zappa, we're intending to refer to just one of those people, and context will determine which one. So, singular terms. The question is, how do singular terms work? How do they acquire their meaning? Um, well, expressions that, that use singular terms, such as uh, Bob is short, or the capital city of England is too noisy, these sorts of expressions, what they seem to do is they seem to denote something, or refer to something, or stand for something, or pick something out in the world, and then they ascribe a property to that thing. Uh, so, for example, when we say the capital city of England is too noisy, with the first part, the capital city of England, what we're doing there is we are pointing to something in the world, namely London, this city here, and then with the second part, well, uh, firstly we refer to uh, the property of noisiness, and then we attribute the property of noisiness to London. So that seems to be how that works there. Uh, with the, the um, statement, Bob is short, we point to Bob and then attribute something to him. So the name London, the description, the capital city of England and so on stand for London, the name Bob stands for Bob, and those sorts of expressions seem to work by taking the object then attributing something to it. And that's the common sense view. But this view of singular terms leads to four puzzles, four quite big puzzles. So let's consider them. Firstly, there's a puzzle about identity. So consider this proposition. Bob Dylan is tall. Now, Bob Dylan is also known by the name Robert Zimmerman. Uh, Robert Zimmerman was Bob Dylan's birth name. So the names Bob Dylan and Robert Zimmerman both refer to precisely the same object. Um, so we have uh, Bob Dylan there, that refers to this guy, and then Robert Zimmerman refers to this guy. Simple, simple stuff. Um, so, naturally then, we can substitute one for the other. And so instead of having Bob Dylan is tall, we can say Robert Zimmerman is tall. This second statement is logically equivalent to the first. Well, there's, there's no problem here, right? But now consider this proposition. Robert Zimmerman is Bob Dylan. Um, 
Here we have two singular terms which seem to refer to the same thing. Now, this statement is Robert Zimmerman is Bob Dylan. Uh, so this is saying that Robert Zimmerman is identical to Bob Dylan. Seems like a reasonable enough statement. But applying the logic we saw above, this proposition is logically equivalent to Robert Zimmerman is Robert Zimmerman. All we're doing there is taking the name Bob Dylan and substituting in Robert Zimmerman. They both refer to the same thing, so that should be a reasonable manoeuvre. Now, the problem here is that number four is obviously trivial, whereas three is not trivial. Firstly, three is contingent. Uh, Robert Zimmerman didn't have to also use the name Bob Dylan. Robert Zimmerman might have used a different name, or he might have stuck with his birth name. So it's only contingently true that Robert Zimmerman is Bob Dylan. Four, on the other hand, is necessary. Robert Zimmerman has to be Robert Zimmerman, no matter what. Uh, one way of thinking about this is that it's not contradictory to deny that Robert Zimmerman is Bob Dylan, but it's clearly contradictory to deny that Robert Zimmerman is Robert Zimmerman, as long as we're not equivocating there. Robert Zimmerman must be identical to himself, but uh, although we may say that someone who denies three is wrong, we could hardly say that they're completely and utterly irrational in the way that somebody who denies four would be. Secondly, and this problem is very similar to the first, uh, three is a posteriori. Um, that is, the way we find out that three is true is by empirical evidence. We have to consult the external world. Uh, whereas four is a priori, we can see it's true by reason alone. Uh, and again, similarly, number three is synthetic. Uh, it's true in virtue of the way the world is, whereas number four is analytic. It's true simply by definition. Um, so there's, there seems to be a very big difference then between number three and number four. And yet this difference is created by doing what should be a perfectly reasonable manoeuvre, on the assumption that names work by referring to things. Um, so that's our first puzzle. The second is about substitutivity. So we have two singular terms that refer to the same thing. We've seen that by, by taking singular terms that refer to the same thing and then substituting them in identity statements, we can slightly alter the meaning of the identity statement. But what about the truth value? Well, the truth value doesn't seem to change. Um, these are all pseudonyms used by Bob Dylan, uh, and let's just sort of try substituting them and, and see, see what we get. Well, Robert Zimmerman is Bob Dylan, that's true. So let's try, let's start substituting. Robert Zimmerman is Jack Frost, that's true. Elston Gunn is Jack Frost, that's true. Bob Dylan is uh, Jack Frost, that's, that's true. These are all true. Uh, on the other hand, we can say, you know, Bob Dylan is Captain Beefheart, then substitute on Bob Dylan again, and this remains false. So it seems that when we take identity statements and substitute two singular terms that refer to the same thing, although we might change the meaning in some ways, the truth value remains the same. Unfortunately, there are contexts where substitution does change the truth value. Consider these propositions. Frank thinks that Bob Dylan is a famous musician. Frank thinks that Robert Zimmerman is a famous musician. Now, suppose that Frank isn't aware of Bob Dylan's history. Suppose he knows the name Bob Dylan and has heard a few songs on the radio. He knows many of his friends like Bob Dylan, but he's not aware that Bob Dylan is also known as Robert Zimmerman. Well, in this case, it seems that number five is true, whereas number six is false. Um, and all you have to see to, to, to sort of realise that is to consider that if we ask Frank, who is Bob Dylan? Well, he'd be able to give a good answer. If we ask him, who is Robert Zimmerman? He wouldn't have a clue. So there's a big difference between these two statements. Uh, and yet, again, Bob Dylan and Robert Zimmerman refer to precisely the same person. So if the meaning of those names is, in, is, is determined by who they refer to, how can, how can that be? How can five be true and yet six be false? All we've done is substitute one name for the other, and both of those names refer to the same person. Third problem, non-existent. Uh, okay, so how about uh, 
The Doctor is a time traveller, a wanderer in the fourth dimension. The problem here is obvious. Uh, this is a simple subject predicate sentence, which seems to be true. We have our singular term, the Doctor, and we've noted that these seem to work by denoting something, referring to something, picking something out. So the Doctor seems to denote something that doesn't exist. But if the Doctor doesn't exist, in what sense can he be denoted? In what sense can he be referred to? There's no object to be denoted. The attempt at referring fails. There is no Doctor. Uh, now, Bob Dylan denotes Bob Dylan. The Doctor denotes what? The name the Doctor is an empty term. What it purports to refer to doesn't exist. The problem can be seen more clearly by considering whether this sentence is true or false. Now, it's tempting to say that, well, of course it's true. The Doctor is a time traveller. That's one of the properties of the Doctor. But if there is no Doctor, how can he be a time traveller? It might be tempting at this point to say that there is a Doctor, it's just that he's not real. So the Doctor does denote something, it's just the thing it denotes doesn't really exist. Now, this kind of answer is uh, certainly prima facie quite reasonable, and it was actually given by a philosopher called Alexius Minong, uh, and I might explore his views in a later video. But to see the immediate problem with this kind of response, uh, we only need to consider one of Russell's favourite examples of a, a non-existent. Um, the present King of France is bald. Now here we can really see the problem. When we talk about the Doctor, our minds can kind of construct the object because we've, we've seen him on television, uh, we've seen him in um, you know, stories and, and so on. And so we sort of feel that we know what we're referring to. But in this case, not only is there no present King of France, but we've never been exposed to a present King of France in books or television or anywhere else. Um, so, is the present King of France bald, or is he not bald? Uh, here we can see the absurdity of trying to attribute a property to a non-existent object. The answer to, to this question, it seems, would be neither. Eight is neither true nor false. Now, this answer has its own problems because it violates the law of the excluded middle, which is that for every proposition, either it or its negation is true um, in symbols P or not P. Um, and this law has been considered by Russell and uh, by most philosophers since Aristotle to be one of the most uh, fundamental, inviolable, uh, self-evident laws of thought. Uh, so, naturally... Russell's not going to be entirely satisfied with this solution. Now, another example of some of the pro one of the problems with non-existence uh, are negative existentials. So, let's consider this statement. The Doctor does not exist. Now, this sentence seems to be obviously true. But here's a paradox. If it's true that the Doctor does not exist, then the statement, the Doctor does not exist, can't be about the Doctor because there is no Doctor. The, the singular term, the Doctor, can't really refer to anything. So basically the problem is, if the Doctor denotes something, then the Doctor must in some sense exist, making nine faults. If there's something there for the, the term, the Doctor, to refer to, then the Doctor must, in, must exist in some way, so nine would be false. On the other hand, if the Doctor does not denote anything, then nine seems simply meaningless. Um, the basic problem here is that in order to claim that the Doctor does not exist, we have to assume that the Doctor does exist. Uh, so we get this immediate contradiction. Well, I think that's enough for today. Um, bear these problems in mind, and in the next videos we will think about how to solve them. But uh, there are four big problems for the uh, sort of common sense way of thinking about singular terms and how they work. Um, so I hope that was helpful. I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.